experience is permeating the nature of reality, running your over your paradigms, and getting objective with my guest tonight, NASA physicist, consciousness explorer, and author of his book, My Big Toe, Mr. Tom Campbell. Tom, my good sir, welcome to HXP. Well, thank you, Xavier. Uh, glad to be here. Hopefully, we can uh, uh, make some interesting conversation today. Yes, I, I sure think we will. I, I I would just like to open the conversation by saying that you have the most amazing beard I have ever seen. <laughs> it is the Einstein of beards, and we can call it the Campbell beard if that's okay <laughs> with you. Now, what what makes my beard so uh, unusual? Doesn't it just look like a, any any uh, old guy with a you know white hair and white beard? <laughs> yes, but I like your beard. Okay, so uh, moving past pleasantries, um, <laughs> let's let's talk, uh, Tom, about your work with Mr. Monroe. I, I find Mr. Monroe quite fascinating and. So I, I, kn I know that you guys work together. If you could just get into the birth of Hemisync and your work with Robert Monroe, that, I think that would be interesting. Okay. Um, my introduction, you know, I'm a physicist, and, and uh, my introduction to um, an awareness of a larger reality than just a physical started with uh, TM meditation. And that was why I was in graduate school working on my PhD. Uh, I found out that I could uh, use a TM state to, de you know, to debug software much better and more accurately than I could go over uh, you know, printouts, reams and reams of printouts. Uh, it, was a, it was an easy thing. I could just bring up the printouts in my mind, look at them, and the ones that uh, were faulty would turn red. And I could just look at them and read them, and I was familiar enough with my printouts. I could go find that line, and sure enough, that's where... You know, the keyhole, you know, this is back in the old days where you had punch cards and boxes and boxes of them. It's a very, it was very difficult compared to today's uh, climate of, of debugging. But anyway, uh, I could find errors there. You know, a, a misplaced semicolon was a comma or a punch, punch card hole was a little off center or some kind of thing like that. There was lots of things that created errors. And it was important in those days because you didn't get very many runs and the computers were pretty slow and uh, a different world altogether. So anyway, that was my introduction. And I got out of graduate school, took a job. And before too long, being in that first job, my boss handed me a book of Journeys Out of the Body but Mom, by Bob Monroe. I had never heard of Journeys Out of the Body or Bob Monroe. But when your boss hands you a book and says, read it, you read it. And I did. And the boss says, well, what did you think? And I said, well, if this is true then, wow, there's a whole lot of reality there that I don't know about. And if it's false, then, you know, who can tell? You know, who, how can we tell the difference between whether it's true or not? And then it turned out that Bob Monroe lived and worked just, uh, oh, maybe uh, 45 minutes away from where we all lived and worked. And we had a, an appointment and a bunch of people from where I worked who had also read the book. Um, maybe 10, 15 people, mostly uh, scientists, uh, engineers, that type. We went all out to see Bob Monroe and see who was this guy who wrote this book and was he a, a charlatan or was he for real? And that was my first introduction to Bob Monroe. And while I was there, it turned out Bob had just built a laboratory for the study of consciousness because he'd had these out-of-body experiences happen to him and he wasn't satisfied that it was just weird stuff that happened to him. He wanted to understand it. Bob Monroe was a businessman. He was the, the CEO and founder of a cable company at the time, uh, reasonably wealthy, and uh, lived on this uh, very nice estate out in, uh, in the countryside with you know, horses running alongside the whiteboard fence and that sort of thing. Uh, so he was, he was well-to-do. And my, my first uh, thought in driving into his uh, estate was that he didn't do it for the money because you, you just don't make that much money with that kind of a book if you've already got that much money. It's not worth the trouble. So that wasn't it. So I worked with Bob Monroe um, for the next 10 years, myself and Dennis Menerick. Uh, he was a, an electronic engineer who uh, worked with me. And we went out to Bob's to help understand this out-of-body experience to learn what Bob could teach us about uh, experiencing 
the larger reality ourselves because if it's not your experience, it's not your truth. If, if you just do it all intellectually about Bob's experience, then you're very limited in ever understanding it. Some things you need to experience to understand and the larger consciousness system uh, and this out-of-body reality is just one of those things. So we both had the, had the idea, well, if this turns out just to be bogus, then you know, we're out of there, but well, let's go. It's going to be, sounds exciting, sounds like fun, so let's see what happened. Well, what happened is that uh, before long, Bob had taught Dennis and I both to go out of body when, uh, you know, on demand whenever we wanted to. Hmm. And we did a lot of, of research in evidential things. What could we affect? What kind of information could we gather? You know, that's sort of, that's like uh, remote viewing, if you will. You know, you go see things and, and, and describe what was there and then check it out. We tried healing. We tried, uh, you know, telekinesis. You name it, and we tried it just to see what we could do with it. And all the while, we're working in the lab, building equipment to try to monitor, uh, you know, physiological responses and, and uh, trying to come up with tools that would help uh, drive these uh, altered states of consciousness and, and that sort of thing. So that was uh, my life then for uh, the best part. Well, I'd say five years it was intense. And that means, uh, you know, I was working a 40-hour-a-week job, which was more like a 50 or 55-hour-a-week job. And I was spending 20 hours, 15 to 20 hours a week with Bob Monroe, uh, either working in the lab, doing experiments, or, you know, being the subject of experiments myself and, uh, and having, you know, Bob uh, teach me how to explore this new reality. So that was it. And, and in that amount of time... Um, Dennis and I did find a way to uh, enhance the experience or at least uh, drive the altered states in which this experience, this experience of out-of-body became more accessible to the average person. And that was called binaural beats. And binaural beats are, are technology that you can find on the internet. If you Google binaural beats, you'll find two or three sites that will let you make a binaural beat to suit yourself. And what a binaural beat is, is that you put two independent frequencies, uh, one in each ear. So you need a headset and you need a stereo uh, player. And you put one tone, one pure frequency in one ear. Let's just say 100 uh, hertz in, in one ear. Then you put 104 hertz in the other ear. Now, any of you know a little bit about physics know if you have two pure frequencies like that and they get to mix like in air or in your nervous system that you'll end up with a beat frequency that's the difference between the two frequencies. In this case, the beat frequency would be about four hertz. So what happens is you get the one tone goes in, let's say your right ear, the other tone goes in your left ear, and you get a four hertz beat signal at the corpus callosum, which is the, basically the membrane, that area between the two hemispheres of the brain. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that that beat signal then drives the EEG. So if you put an EEG on a person, you will find more and more of the energy in their EEG starts to fall under the four hertz um, you know, frequency range in that, in that range. So that's, that's a theta state. So we tried that on lots of people. Some knew what we were doing. Most were just naive and, you know, here, listen to this and, you know, what happens? And we, were, we had EEG on them and GSR and other sorts of uh, monitoring equipment and then we talked to them about what their experience was like and so on and and we we, we realized that this was really a pretty powerful um tool that would help one get into what i guess we might call a good meditation state and by good i mean a very productive one one that uh, one that's useful um for uh for then focusing one's intent and healing or traveling or doing what else you wanted to do so that was, um, was kind of how I got uh, connected with Bob Monroe and uh, how Dennis and I ended up uh, discovering this, this binaural beats. And actually, Dennis was really the one that came up with it. He, had, he was reading a uh, Scientific American uh, article, and uh, the author of an article, this was now back in 1972, mm. and the, uh, there was an article by, I don't remember the first name, but the last name was Oster. And uh, he wrote about binaural beats, and he gave a little bit of, it was a, kind of a new thing, and he was just writing this article to introduce the concept of the people, 
and he indicated that it that, uh, that there was a possibility that it might uh, um, influence you know EEG output. So Dennis saw that and said, "Okay, here's something for us to try at the lab because we knew this four hertz was a was a um, a signature that Bob Monroe got as he left." his body, he would get this vibration of four hertz. So that was one fact we had to work with, and we thought we would try to, um, you know, encourage that four hertz beat. And if your whole brain uh, and nervous system was oscillating at four hertz, you know, maybe that would be a way. We didn't know, but we were in a cut and try experimental mode to see what happened. So it, it worked. Uh, pretty well. Dennis and I played with it for another week or two by ourselves because Bob was out of town. So we had to optimize it. You know, what's the base frequency? Was it four hertz or four and a half or, you know, 3.75 you know, or what? And at what amplitude do you play it? Um, a lot of other variables that we, we went through to try to optimize the effect of the uh, entraining brainwaves. And when Bob came back, we played him the, the, the tones and uh, he was very impressed with it as well and began to add some of his own sounds to it, which were mostly uh, relaxation sounds, you know, like surf sounds, that, that kind of thing. But, but the surf sounds actually weren't real surf. They also had like four hertz. Uh, white noise. Uh, white noise. Well, it was more like pink noise. Uh, pink noise is, is white noise with the high, the high end cut off. So it's not quite so jarring. It's, uh, it's a little softer sound. So it was a pink noise modulated to four hertz. And, and actually it had kind of a delta wave in there too. So that's what we had been using before we, we found these binaural beats. And afterwards, we had that original sound with the binaural beat laid you know, into it. They were, they were put together in the same track. So that became Hemisync. And Hemisync is a signature technology of Monroe Laboratories. Bob Monroe uh, got a patent on that. And it has probably changed and modified many times between then and now. So it's not necessarily the same hemisync that you'd listen to if you, you know, bought a, a, a current tape uh, from the Monroe Institute. But that was the beginning, anyway, of, of, uh, of hemisync. Yeah, I definitely suggest anyone listening to the show right now to check out, A, Robert, uh, Robert Monroe's work and his books, and B, uh, hemisync if they can, just because... I personally used Hemisync for about 10 years uh, just as I was beginning my meditation phase, and it really helped quite a lot. So getting the history of that is is very intriguing. So how did you move from working with uh, Mr. Monroe to develop, developing a theory of everything? How does a person do that? Well... Uh, being a physicist, you know, I'm, a, I'm a scientist kind of through and through, and, and as a physicist, my, my job is to understand reality. That's what physics is. It's, you know, how does the world work? So that's what physicists do, and that's where my mindset was. So once I understood that reality was bigger than just this physical reality, and then I understood after being with Bob that I could explore that with some... Uh, um, uh, let's say some regularity. In other words, I could, I could produce altered states pretty precisely and go to the same states and do the same things in the same way and try to eliminate all the variables that I could and then change one variable and see what difference it made. You know? So I could do experiments in this space. So I began uh, very early, if probably after a year or two uh, at Bob Monroe's, early in the process, my job kind of in the group was theory, you know, to understand what went on. How could you explain it? What's the connection between physical reality and this larger reality? What is the larger reality? Uh, where does it come from? What does it do? Why is it there? How do we relate to it? You know, et cetera, et cetera. All the questions about trying to understand what is it and how does it work? So I continued with that for the next roughly 35 years and from that was starting in 1972. So in, in 2003, in February, I published the books My Big Toe. So it took me that long, and that was pretty continuous. There's not much time that I was away from that, uh, you know, doing other things. I pretty much worked on it continuously for, for that amount of time, uh, doing research, experimenting, uh, experiencing, 
um, that sort of thing. And it was not until then that I actually thought I had an idea about how it worked. So I wrote these books, and the books started out to be sort of an explanation of the larger reality and consciousness. And that was more metaphysics and philosophy than physics, although I knew that was the bigger picture, and everything else had to derive from that. But I really didn't understand how that might happen. I just kind of, I, I knew that that was, you know, the way it had to go. I call it a big toe, a big theory of everything, because it was the foundation. Consciousness is the fundamental thing, and everything else is derived thereof. But then after the books were published, um, I realized that the same logic that I used to describe consciousness and how consciousness worked and its parameters described how physics worked as well. It's the very same idea. I, didn't know, I don't know why it took me so long to get that, but it did. I was probably a year or so after the publication, and it's like, uh, oh, look, this is why the double slit experiment works the way it does, and this is why C is a constant, and this is why, you know, we have entanglement, and all of these big mysteries in physics that, uh, you know, where does mass come from? Where does charge come from? Uh, all of these unknowns, all of these hard problems just disappeared. It was clear that uh, there was a, a very nice logical derivation of all of them, and it all came from the same two assumptions that uh, really drove the theory of consciousness and, and uh, the larger reality. So it was all very neat and elegant and contained within just a few ideas. It explained all of that. So that's kind of how I ended up writing those books. It was, just my, it was just the way I'm built, I guess, that I kept working on trying to understand it until I finally got somewhere. Just your, your search for answers and looking for truth? Yeah, pretty much. And, and the thing that really helped is that being a scientist, I'm kind of a, a, um, you know, programmed, if you will, to think logically, to have a high level uh, of uh, proof, you know, requirement for proof. If it, you know, it, it has to make sense from all angles. Uh, you have to repeat it many times. And I don't, uh, you know, I don't go there if it isn't, I don't go on that ground if it isn't solid. So that helped me having this attitude of, of go do the experiments, you know, see, see where the limits are. Wh where do you run up against the wall in, in, uh, in this process? So that was, that was it. So because I was a scientist and because also I had spent, you know, 35 years studying consciousness, I was able to put it together. I don't think I could have put it together if I had just either one of those uh, uh, mindsets or either one of those sets of experience. It took both, the physics experience and mindset and the experience in the larger consciousness system. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to pull it together. So let's let's break it down for our listeners. I mean, it, so there there is we're in a computer basically, and there someone has pressed an on button, and it's kind of running this program. It, am I am I close? Yeah, yeah, you're close. It's not that we are in a computer. It depends on who you define we as, because there's we the body in this physical reality in this physical universe, and then there's we the consciousness. And those two things are not the same thing. So if we say we, the consciousness, then we are, we are not really in the computer as far as in the, in the, uh, in the simulation that makes the physical reality. We're in the, the larger computer, if you will, which is the larger consciousness system. Consciousness itself is a, an information field. It's an information system. And that would make sense if you think of what is consciousness. It's information. It's basically information and communication. That makes up consciousness. Uh, your awareness of your reality has to do with the data that you collect through your senses. If you had no, no sight, no, no sound, no smell, no taste, and no touch, then what would your reality be like? Well, mm -hmm. your, your reality would be, uh, you know, basically you'd be floating uh, in, the, in the void, in a black, dark void. There would be no uh, reality, just, just the fact that I am. You'd, you'd be aware that you exist and nothing else would be there. So you can see that awareness, consciousness um, is information. Our reality is information and our thoughts are also information. 
Uh, our, uh, you know, our thoughts carry information. That's, that's what they do. It's a, it's a way of our language carries information. Our thinking carries information. So an information system describes consciousness. And then this consciousness, this larger consciousness system, creates a virtual reality called our physical universe for us to experience in. And it has its own reasons for, for doing that. But that kind of maybe straightens out a little bit what you were saying. So... So then, are we presumably virtual reality characters in this sort of virtual machine, and then our consciousness is the information, we, would you even call it a sort of magnifying lens, or just information? No, it's, a, it's a, uh, a subset of the larger consciousness system. Our consciousness is a subset. You know, we're a piece of that larger consciousness system, and it, you know, our consciousness, of course, is information, processing, memory, um, you know, all of, all of that experience. We have all of that stuff that defines us. All of the choices we've made, all of the experience we've had kind of define us as who we are and, and our, our uniqueness. But think of it uh, in this, with the same model of, say, the world of Warcraft. In the world of Warcraft, say you, you're playing a, an elf, or the Sims would be the same sort of thing where you're playing a character. But let's say world of Warcraft, you have an elf. Now, the elf is not conscious. You are the elf's consciousness. If you don't give that elf any direction, if you don't tell it what to do, it just stands there and does nothing. Maybe it wobbles around a little bit, but it just it has, no, you know, it has no direction without you, the player. Now, you, the player, um, are its consciousness, but there's another point here to, to, to see and that is the elf's reality does not contain you, the consciousness. The elf's reality and the elf's body and the rule set that defines World of Warcraft creates constraints on a data stream that is passed to you, the consciousness. So you sitting at your computer receive a data stream, and you interpret that data stream as the World of Warcraft world. But you cannot be inside the World of Warcraft world. You, the consciousness, must be in a separate reality frame outside of the virtual reality in which you're playing. In other words, the elf in World of Warcraft will never find a building that has the server in it that's creating the World of Warcraft. <laughs> you see? Mm, yeah. the, the World of Warcraft, the server that creates the World of Warcraft can't be a part of the World of Warcraft world. It has to exist outside of that world. It has to exist, as Fredkin said, in other. That's just someplace else other than the World of Warcraft world. And why is that? Because a simulation can't create itself. You know, it, it can't, that's like third grade logic, right? A, a, uh, you know, a simulation can't create itself because before it created itself, it didn't exist to create itself. You see, that's a, a pretty simple idea. There, is there an intelligence within this larger consciousness? I mean, is it... Yes, it's consciousness. It's, uh, you know, we're intelligent. It's intelligent. Uh, intelligence basically comes from learning from your experience. And this is, this larger conscious system has a, a more vast experience than we do. We're just subsets of it. And the subset never contains all the information of the superset. So it's a larger thing than we are altogether. But yes, it is intelligent. It's aware. It's conscious. And it has a, you know, it has a, uh, a mission, and that is to survive. When you talk about information systems, you have, you know, two uh, different extreme states, and you are, you're suspended somewhere between them. And that is, if every bit in the information system is random, then there is no information. There is no awareness. There is no consciousness. There's nothing. There's just random bits. There's no structure. There's no meaning. There's no content. So content requires uh, structure. It requires uh, um, order, if you will. It requires pattern. And that is how physics defines the word called entropy. High entropy means um, randomness. You have high entropy if you have a lot of randomness in an information system. And you have low entropy if you have a lot of content or a lot of structure. So entropy is a matter, is a measure of disorder. 
more disorder, high entropy, less, less disorder or more order, and you have low entropy. So an information system, and this is just standard uh, you know, information science I'm talking about now, an information system then can, can be described in terms of its entropy, how evolved it is, how much information it has as opposed to randomness. So the system is, a, is a, an aware, evolving system. It's changing you know, as, as we do. We're evolving, it's evolving, and what it has to do to maintain itself is it always has to put forth effort in order to uh, not dissolve into randomness. And that's something that takes effort because if you don't do anything, if you just sit and there's no maintenance, there's no effort, then randomness happens and you know, entropy happens and you start to uh, disintegrate. You start to come apart, dissolve. Your order begins to go away. So constant effort is, is needed and what this system is doing, it's evolving, and it's evolving toward more functional information and lower states of entropy, and it's, it, has to, it has to keep working. Now, we're pieces of it, so that's what we're doing, too. That's the overall uh, uh, dynamic here is that the whole system is trying to lower its entropy or maintain its entropy and lower its entropy. It, uh, it does that by... It's choices. If it makes good choices, you know, it has choices. We're talking about an information system that's sharing information, and we're pieces of it. So it's this interaction between subsets of itself, and how it interacts requires choices. Choices of what to do and what to do with the information you get and what to do about what to send and, and uh, so on. If those choices are choices that help build and, and produce and create more structure, more information, then that's on the path to evolution. And if those choices create more randomness and uh, you know, tear things apart, then that choice is you know, on the way toward de-evolution for the system. And we are in this physical reality as pieces of the system uh, put here, or I should say playing here, in order to have a reality frame with enough rules that we get good feedback on the value of our choices. What are our choices doing? You know, what kind of choices are they? If there's no rules, then there's no way to assess what it is you're doing. So we need, uh, we need rules. And once we have rules, those rules define a virtual reality. Now, I'm kind of skipping around in the, in, in the theory here a little bit, just trying to get people up to up to speed and there's lots of things i've left out okay but but anyway we, that's kind of you know it's kind of where we're going so yes we're in a virtual reality yes we're consciousness consciousness can't be in the same reality as the virtual reality that it's playing in uh, you can't be in the same reality as your elf you have to be in a different reality than your elf so you are a piece of consciousness you are not uh, in this physical reality. In other words, your, your consciousness is not derived from the physical reality. So how, how does free will play into the aspect of growth, learning, and the information system? Okay, well, there's a few things that that information system needs to be conscious. And the, the way we, we start is with a system that uh, is just awareness, and it's not really conscious yet. We can call it primordial conscious, if you like. It's awareness. And that awareness can do no more than be aware that it's in state one or state two, you know, state A or state B. So it's a, and this is just an assumption. We start there, that there is such a, a thing, such an entity that can tell whether it's in state one or state two. And we have to start there. It's not a, uh, that's not a, a, a flaw or um, an assumption that, um, kind of starts in the middle, I can, we'll talk about later about the limits of knowledge, and it, it requires such a start. Anyway, so here we have this system, and if the system can distinguish between states one and state two, then a few things have just happened. One, time has just been invented, because if now I'm in one, and you know, later I'm in two, then there's a before and an after state, and then time is invented. So in order to even have a system that can be aware of being in one state or another, you have to have time. Otherwise, it couldn't change between one state or another, which means it really wouldn't be aware that there were two states. 
hmm. it would have to be. So time is an integral part of this existence. Without the time, you can't be in state one and then state two. There's no before and after. Now, the thing evolves. So this is a, a system and it evolves. And as it evolves, remember it's, it's creating information. If it goes to randomness, if it loses its idea of these two steps, then it's back to randomness. There's, there's nothing there. So it evolves and it gets lots of this state, that state, the other states, um, multiple states, lots of ones, lots of, lots of twos or A's and B's, and it can uh, <clears throat> then put those in, a, in patterns and it can make patterns of patterns. So we have an evolution going on here with this, with this system. But it gets limited after a while, so what it can do is just one monolithic thing. It's just the thing, and it's making patterns and things, but there's, there's, it's uh, kind of giving its own meaning, I guess, to those patterns, and it's very limited. So what it does is what is natural to things that evolve. It's the same thing our biological cells did. Uh, once it lowered entropy to... Um, the point of its patterns and patterns of patterns and so on, information, you know, there's this, this state and that state, you can think of it as ones and zeros in a computer. Um, then it needs to interact, and it has to interact with a piece of itself. So the thing in our biology, the cells split, or multiple one-celled things got together to make a many-celled thing, or cells split and build up a many-celled thing, however you want to look at that. That's the way that you create now a whole new set of novelty where interactions and patterns become um, you know, much more extensive. You've just, you've just uh, added another whole degree of freedom with that because now we have communication. But the communication doesn't mean anything if there's no free will. If the two things that are communicating can't communicate independently and freely – then there's really no communication. If it's just you talking to yourself and you go, hello, me, and me says, hi, how you doing? I'm doing fine, but it's all just you playing both parts, then you haven't done anything more than just be the one thing you were. You're still that monolithic thing. Hmm. So unless you, get, unless you uh, give that other entity free will, in other words, it can make choices on its own. You don't make its choices for it. It has the freedom to choose between the available choices that it has. If there's more than one way it can react to you, then it gets to choose which one of those multiple ways it will, it will react. What kind of data is it going to share with you? How will it interpret the data you send it? That has to be free. Otherwise, you're still stuck with one monolithic thing and you're, you're not evolving. Uh, so now we have free will. So you have to have time. You have to have free will. And there's one more thing you have to have, and that is you need a virtual reality. Now, a virtual reality, I, I defined before, is just a, a rule set. You know, it, you have information, and if you have a rule set, you can create a virtual reality based on those rules. Like the World of Warcraft is based on a rule set that defines what the elf and all the other characters and things can do. The elf cannot walk through a tree. The elf falls off a cliff. You know, it does get hurt. The elf stays underwater too long. It will drown. It will die. Um, and so on. It's because there's a rule set that defines the constraints of exchanges, of interactions between things. Okay, so what rule set's required here? It's communication. You have to at least make the rules that define a basic communication protocols so that these two... Uh, these, these two entities, these two pieces of consciousness can talk to each other, can communicate, pass data back and forth. So you need a, you know, what we would call a, a language. Now, this is not a spoken language, obviously, but you, you need a, uh, the protocols for communication. So those are the things. We need this, we need this um, basic prototype of consciousness that is, has awareness. Time is awareness between two states. Free will is required so it can interact with something other than just itself so that it has something unique to interact to because when it does, there's lots of novelty and lots of new ways to construct and build and, and make patterns. So that's in its path to evolution. And then you have to have a virtual reality, which is a rule set that creates the ability to communicate. So that's, all these things are necessary for consciousness. 
if you take any of those away, then there is no consciousness. So consciousness exists. All these things get, you know, exist at the same time. They're all logically necessary for each other. Are there more advanced, uh, less en- entropy systems that information systems that exist more efficiently, higher planes of existence? Uh, no, I wouldn't say more efficiently. Um, there are lots of other virtual realities. Our physical universe is not the only virtual reality. There, there are many. Some, some of them are, uh, have very loose rule sets. There's no, there's no more rule set than just the communication protocols. You know, at that point, the, the virtual reality is like a, uh, you know, a big chat room that has, let's say, 100,000 people in the chat room, and there's no other rules other than you know, how to communicate, that you can type and it gets displayed. That's, that's the rule set. Well, that makes a very, uh, um, <laughs> very loose, very minimalist rule set uh, for a virtual reality. And then there's virtual reality like ours that uh, has a rule set. Well, let's, let's say a minute, uh, just for a minute, how our reality is made. Our reality was created not by planting a programmer planting every tree and rock. It wasn't programmed. It evolved. So it was given some, you get, take some initial conditions and <laughs> a rule set. Now those initial conditions are, at our best guess at this time, was a very, a very small ball of plasma at extremely high energy and high pressure. And that plasma, when the run button was hit, that plasma changed according to the rule set. So the initial conditions were set up this, this plasma of various type. And you hit the run button and, and it starts to change because of the pressure it expands. And as it expands, it cools. And as it cools, you get suns and then planets and solar systems. And then you get an earth and then you get a cell that evolves to be us sitting here talking over Skype. So <laughs> that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's how our physical universe is created. It's created as a simulation. It is evolving and it continues to evolve. It isn't uh, programmed like World of Warcraft. So we have this, this virtual reality, and it's evolving. And why did we need it? Because if the point of this, this uh, well, I'm going to back up one, one more step that I, that I need to make all this coherent. And that sure. is when you have a, social, when you have a, a uh, system of individuated units of consciousness that are communicating with each other, uh, and you do this, like I say, in order to give more, more, uh, more degrees of freedom, more things that you can construct that way, then what you end up with is a social system because it's a lot of chunks of consciousness interacting with each other. That's a social system. If you take a social system, how do you optimize it? What do you do to optimize your social system? What do you do to reduce entropy as much as possible within this social system since reducing entropy is really the the goal here to keep this thing going and alive. Mm-hmm. Well, the answer to that is by cooperation, by working together, by um, uh, co-op, you know, cooperating, caring, um, and I call that the, the uh, kind of the love path, if you will, the love direction. And the opposite of that is what I call the fear direction. And the fear would be uh, is, is, a, uh, is all about self, and the love is all about other. How do, you, how do we optimize this all together is the, is the uh, love direction, and how can I get as much as I can for myself is what we have in the fear direction. Okay, so in that fear direction, you see, if everyone is out for themselves and there's no trust because it's, you know, it's based on fear. It's all about you and me, and I need to have what I need, and then when I get it, I need to keep it so nobody takes it away from me. And then, because something bigger or stronger than me can take it away from me, I uh, join up with other units so that we together are, will have a kind of a mutual defense pack, and that will keep other entities from taking our stuff away from this, and, of course, the other entities will form up their own mutual defense packs, and then these two groups of entities can fight and struggle with each other, trying to get each other's stuff and, and uh, make sure that nobody else gets their stuff. And See, that starts to sound like us, right, in wow. our reality. Yeah. That's, the, that's the way we, you know, that's the, that's the way we work here. We're basically fear-based in this virtual reality. So 
You take those two. Now, the one that is cooperative and each unit of it cares about optimizing the whole, that group will eventually uh, you know, optimize what they, whatever they've got. They will all cooperate in a way to build as much as they can build. In the other one, it'll never get but so you know, low in entropy because there's always somebody tearing something down because somebody else has something you want. Well, then you know, they've built something up. You tear it down or you take it over. Uh, you build things up, other people tear it down. It's a constant struggle um, to uh, and competitive world in which it's very difficult to uh, cooperate, but so much. Because <laughs> if you, you know, cooperation to, to be really effective requires trust. And if there's no trust in a fear-based world, then there's really, it's hard to cooperate. It's hard to get together. It's hard to build. It's hard to find investors because... It's, um, you know, you might lose your investment. So, so do, these, do these separate, would you call them systems or are they just, uh, I mean, how would you define these two subsets? And do they, do they move apart and then together? So the people or the entities that kind of dwell around fear, would they kind of collect together and then same with the ones that are around love? No. It's not, that these, it's not that these two various subsets were created. I'm, I, my description was just to, to show or just to point out that we have an entity. It's broken itself into pieces. It's interacting, and it's doing this all to reduce its entropy so it can stay alive and exist. Ah, right. You see? So then how does it do that? You see, how does it optimize itself to do that? Well, the way it does that is by making choices that are cooperative, that are supportive of the, of the whole and of, and of each other. Now, the way that a, that a, uh, so in a social system, the way that works is that the individuals, the way they interact is by making choices. It's whatever they do, it's a choice. It's an intent, and the intent then is followed through by a, by a choice. And if you make choices that move you toward the love side, that move you toward the cooperative side about other, uh, then you are part of the solution toward lowering entropy. If you make choices that are all self-focused and, and based on fear, then you are moving the system toward uh, de-evolution. So that gives the system now a, a, a goal, what to do. Okay, so here it is. Now it knows what to do. It needs to, to give its pieces experience that helps them evolve toward love because that's how it survives so it needs then to create a virtual reality with more traction with more feedback than this big chat room with a hundred thousand <laughs> uh, things chatting in it you see with no rules because that has very little traction how do you know what your effect is on anything wow. and how does, and how do you know what you're getting is that just made up or is it true? There's no traction there, you see. Yes, you can pass information around, but it's a really slow process of understanding how to make choices such that the system survives. So you need a virtual reality where you have a rule set, a tight enough rule set where the feedback from your choices is pretty obvious. You know, what, what you are and how the choices you make makes a difference. And those consequences are right there in your face. You deal with them. So that's the kind of virtual reality that's been created with this um, set of initial conditions and the rule set. And you hit the run button. And, of course, that rule set is, is our physics. It's basically the rules of how things can interact, how energy can be exchanged within this virtual reality. In this computation, this virtual reality is a simulation, an evolving simulation. And it was created to create experience where choices could be made with feedback. So our virtual reality, our physical universe, is kind of the fast track in consciousness evolution because we have all these choices. But you, you know, if you look at it, yeah, we're still pretty fear-based, but we've got a long way to go and we're making progress. But you, know, you start at the beginning and you, you work on it. And we are not the only such um, what we might call, you know, this virtual reality, you can call it, uh, you know, an entropy reduction trainer for individuated <laughs> units of consciousness. We're not the only uh, entropy reduction trainer going on. There are others. 
the system wouldn't put all its eggs in one basket. It would, uh, it would uh, tweak uh, parameters and the physics, you know, the rule set a little, and maybe the initial conditions. You need to get something that's stable and, and, and functional. So now we are, we as consciousness are very much like we as the, as the player in World of Warcraft. Consciousness doesn't exist in the physical uh, virtual reality. The physical virtual reality we call our physical universe just sets the constraints on what, you know, what the uh, consciousness can experience through that avatar, through that being. Just like World of Warcraft rule set sets the constraints on what you can experience with your elf. Your elf can only do certain things, act certain ways, and you know if it does good things, its hit points go up and it goes up levels, and if it does bad things, it goes down levels and loses hit points. So there's a there's a structure, a rule set set, and and uh, that gives us choice and results of choices. So hmm. here we are, chunks of consciousness. We are uh, playing a an avatar, a character which just like the elf, it's just a computed character. Our body and this physical reality is just the computations of a simulation, just like World of Warcraft is, you see? So it's the same sort of thing. So we're consciousness and we're playing, we're playing this game. It's, a, it's an immersive game. We actually, we talk about ourselves as an individuated unit of consciousness. That's kind of the accumulator, if you will. That's the, that's the, the larger us. And a piece of that, is immersed in this game, is a player in this game. So uh, your, your body's just like the elf. It's a, it's a computed uh, entity, and you get a data stream from the server, which is in the larger consciousness system, outside the physical reality, and the data stream is constrained by the constraints of the rule set of that virtual reality. Hmm. So that means that if somebody sneaks up behind you, your, your avatar, and hits you over the head with a lead pipe and causes brain damage, what that is is it, it increases the constraints on that character. Now that character maybe slurs its words and drags its left foot because of the brain damage. You see, so it just increased the constraints. And you can also decrease constraints if you do things that enable you to do more, see bigger pictures, have a larger uh, decision space. So that's kind of the basic nature of you know how reality works and the neat thing about it is that since i published this in 2003 it was me and maybe two or three other people on the planet who saw this reality as you know being best modeled as a virtual reality and now there's a lot of physicists at uh, all the best institutions that think virtual reality is the way of the future because the experiments that physicists do just keep saying that, you know, this reality is virtual, that reality is informational. Physicists no longer look at electrons as chunks of matter with charge. They look at electron as a point with the attribute of charge and the attribute of mass. Well, how would we model an electron in a, in a computer? We'd, we'd model it as a point with the attribute of charge and the attribute of mass. So that's we're moving that way. Science is going that way. Physics is going that way. So virtual reality seems to be what the experiments, and it started in early 1900s, the double slit experiment was the first one that, uh, that basically pointed in that direction. And, and many, many others have. I don't go by a month that I don't see another paper published in some uh, refereed physics journal uh, explaining that virtual reality is the only way to uh, explain this experiment. So it's it's a it's a coming thing in physics. That makes so much sense. I'm I'm quite surprised that I haven't heard this before or heard this theory sooner. Uh, how do how would deities or archetypes like beings like Christ and and God type figures play into this information system? Okay, well you've named several different kinds of things there. <laughs> okay. The uh, you know archetypes. Let's talk about archetypes as they were defined by uh, Carl Jung. Uh, Archetypes, as he defined them, were uh, kind of ideas, th ways of thinking, ways of being that uh, are common to a group of individuals. And that group might be a culture. You know, all the people in this culture kind of think and see the world this way. And, or it could be a species like humans. There are archetypes. There's the human archetypes. There's cultural archetypes. And uh, 
and so on. He worked that down, but uh, he didn't actually see the bigger picture of the archetypes or where they come from. But the archetypes are are created out of, um, we can say, group consciousness, if you if you will. It's a shared shared thoughts. All the individuated units of consciousness are netted. Okay, that's what conscious does. It communicates, and intent is the is the um, is the motive force. Intent is is what uh, you know makes that communication go. It's what moves data. So all the individual units of consciousness are all in a big net, just like uh, the world you know the World Wide Web. All those web pages are on a big net, but you have to have an intent to go click on one of them to get that information. If you don't have that intent, then you don't see that web page. But if you if you have an intent to see that information. Then you click on it, you get that information, and you can share information with it. So it's like that. We're all connected. But it doesn't, it's not like the World Wide Web in that you don't really have to click. All you have to do is have a connection, an intention that kind of includes people in your group. And then you, you're sharing information. Now, we see that, say, at the bottom and most simple level is a mob. You take a mob and you have uh, 20 people in a mob that want to lynch somebody and you will find that the psychology of that mob is at a lower level than the psychology of any of the individuals. So the mob itself will act worse than any of the individuals would by themselves. Why? Because they're sharing. They're trading all this information around and they're you know, feeding each other's frenzy, if you will, each other's fear, each other's uh, anxiety, each other's uh, um, you know, hate or whatever it is. So because of that mutual reinforcement, it gets worse and worse. You do the same thing if you're in a, you know, if you're in with a bunch of people who are full of love and caring and respect and all that, it kind of pulls you up some. You act a little better when you're around those people. Right. Of course, you walk away from those people and you're still just yourself because you, you don't, um, you know, you haven't learned anything. You have to learn it at the being level. Uh, that's another concept. We have an intellectual level and a being level. Your being level is the core of what's really you. Your intellectual level uh, is, is what you think. In other words, let's say we're talking about being kind. If you, if you are kind because you think it's a good idea and you should be, that's acting kind. But if you're kind at the being level, you just are kind. You, say, you don't have to think about it. You don't have to say, well, should I help that person? Well, I probably should because it would, it would be nice to do that. And that's an intellectual decision. That's acting kind. But if you see a person that needs help and you just help them, you don't think about it. It's just the way you are. You see, that's, that's kindness at the being level. So we, we work in these two, you know, at these two different uh, levels. So I, now I kind of have a bigger picture, right? So we started with the, with the assumption of the thing that just uh, was aware of states and we got time and with time, you know, we, we, we had a, yeah, we, we have mis- information exchange, which is the virtual reality. We also had it break apart so that it would be able to create more uh, structure uh, with itself. And it just did that because that's what evolution does. It finds things that work. And then once it finds that thing, it works. It works with it. And if it finds things that don't work, it just disappear. So it did that. So we have consciousness now. Consciousness has free will. There's time. And it's aware and it's an information system because all these this and that states are ones and zeros. It learns to communicate, which is basically what patterns are. See, a pattern itself is a communication. Uh, if I make a pattern and I say up, down, up, down, up, down, you know what the next one's going to be. It's going to be an up. Hmm. See, how did you know that? Because there's information in the pattern. So the pattern, patterns are information. And so this is our system, and because it needed to survive, it needed the lower entropy, it's a social system, and the way to do that is toward cooperation, love, and caring. So that's the way the choices and interactions had to go. The big uh, 10,000, 100,000 people in a chat room wasn't very effective, so it needed to make a virtual reality that had more rules than just communication protocols, and it had to be one that... that gave good feedback from, you know, by, by having enough rules that you got re- consequences for your actions and you could actually see the results of them. So that's hmm. kind of the big picture, pulled it all together, and, and here we are um, as a, um, I call it a free will awareness unit, which is the part of the individuated unit of consciousness that is immersed 
in this game. And uh, just like you might be immersed in playing World of Warcraft. And then because it takes a while to change at the bean level, you see growth. Real entropy reduction of the system is when consciousness reduces its entropy. It becomes a different thing. It, it changes itself at the being level, uh, not just uh, becomes aware of something at the intellectual level. So we have to grow up. We have to move toward becoming love and cooperation and caring as opposed to it's all about me, gimme, gimme, gimme. So this process goes on and the whole thing evolves as we evolve. We evolve individually, but as we do, it evolves because we're, we're it. We're part of it, you see? So that's, the, that's kind of the dynamics. And now we've defined a whole lot of things. We've defined morality. Uh, something's good if it leads toward the individual and the system lowering its entropy. Something's bad if it you know, leads the individual and therefore the, the whole into uh, increasing its entropy. That's Now we have a morality. We understand love, and we can give it a technical definition. Love is the nature of a low entropy consciousness. That's what love is. Um, we have um, defined the, our physical reality. Why is it? How does it work? That it's virtual, that it's computational, it's a simulation, and it's evolving. We've defined ourselves and our relationship to it. We're players in a virtual reality game, and we're here to make choices to help ourselves evolve toward lower entropy states. So that kind of pulls now a whole lot of things together. And because this simulation is, that, that is our physical reality is not a deterministic simulation, it's a probabilistic simulation. Deterministic simulations are just way too much computation. They're not efficient. Uh, it's much better if you um, use the computations to develop probability distributions and then run your simulations from those probability distributions. That's just a, a more uh, efficient process because you have the rule set. The system has, it, it's the system's rule set. It knows all the rule sets, so it can do the the calculations to produce the probability distributions that describe the way you know action unfolds here in terms of probability. Are there are there rule sets that can purposely alter or hinder the growth of certain subsets of systems? For example, could could my choices be limited because I don't have money? How how does how does the macro system assure that growth within the system itself occurs. Okay, your choices are not limited because you don't have money. Your choices are different because you don't have money. Mm. You see, it doesn't limit your, your choices. It's, your choices are different. Now remember, the, the, the goal here is to lower your entropy, not to uh, see how much you know, money you can collect or how much beer you can drink. It's to lower your entropy. It's to grow up. And all the choices you make, be they rich or poor, give you opportunities and challenges to grow up. So you have as, just as rich an environment in, you know, to, in growing up as rich or poor or you know, anything else, any other kind of dichotomy that you can come up with. So the choices are everywhere. And rich or poor is just different choices, not better or worse choices. Hmm, very, very Interesting. It, it it actually makes sense, <laughs> and it, it it really does. It fits. So, how does how does synchronicity and metaphysics, like picking up on energy and perceiving information before it's available, how does all of this stuff, uh, other stuff, kind of work in? Okay. Well, one of the interesting things about this is that what's normally seen as paranormal turns out to just be normal once you have a bigger picture. Paranormal means outside of normal. You know, it can't be explained by normal, normal uh, understanding. So the paranormal is just normal because in the bigger picture we have, um, we can explain several of those, those things. Um, let's see, I'll start with your, your one about information. Uh, part of the structure in creating this virtual reality and maintaining it uh, requires a couple of databases. And one of the databases is called the Future Probable Database. And the Future Probable Database is a database of 
all the things that could happen in the next delta t, okay, the next delta p means the next little increment of time, okay, we're in a, we're in a simulation, so time is the outer loop. Time uh, uh, jumps up one increment, and then you recalculate everything that's now in that time. And, of course, choices are made. We have free will choices, so choices are made, and the next delta T, then, you know, those choices get, uh, you know, uh, happen. So that's the future probable database. Everything that could possibly happen and the probability that it might happen. So you may have 10 choices. You may have a decision space and there's 10 different things that you could choose, way that you could go here, and there's a probability based on your past performance and you know, who you are and how you've done, you have a probability of which one you'll choose. That means that the system itself it can, can kind of keep current on what's going to happen next so it can be ready because it's got a lot of, of uh, data streams to service, and it doesn't want to wait and get surprised. It, it works on a probability basis so that it can do probably 90, 98% of its work just based on probability. And, and then around the edges, you know, we do things that, that aren't probable. We, we can sometimes just do strange things that uh, our free will enables us to do. And then the system basically has to recalculate that effect forward, rebuilding the, the, a new uh, probable uh, thread along that, that action and all the things it interacts with. So that's one database. And then we have our history database. And our history database is, I, I, I break it into two parts. It's just one database, but there's two ways of looking at it, two sections to it. There's everything that could have happened and the probability that it would have happened. Okay, so now that's just that future probable database as it moves through the present, which is where all the choices are made. That's where all the action is, is in the present. As it moves through the present into the past, you end up with it now as a history database. And instead of everything that could happen and the probability it does, it's everything that could have happened and the probability that it would have. Okay, now there's a thread, one thread that runs through that past database that is our actual history. That's what we actually did. Okay, and that's our history thread. Now, those databases are available to us because we are consciousness. Yes, we are immersed in this, uh, in this virtual reality game, but we're still consciousness, and as consciousness, we can um, do everything that consciousness can do. We can communicate. We, can, uh, you know, we pass information between other uh, units of consciousness. So it's... it's- it's in the interest of the system for us to evolve. Exactly, because our evolution is its evolution, you see. So the system wants us to evolve, and it gives us the, um, kinda the tools to do that in the, in the virtual reality. And there's one other point I haven't made yet, and that is one of the feedback systems that we have in this virtual reality is that we can modify the probability in the future probable database with our intent. So with a focused and clear intent, we can modify that, you know, of those 10 things we might choose, we can kind of raise the probability hmm. of, of what happens. And because it's not just our choice, that, that thing may be affected by a lot of other people who are also, you know, uh, connected to that particular choice. And uh, we can raise or lower the, the probability of that happening with our intent. So that's why you have people who are very positive often live in very positive circumstances. Things just kind of happen for them. And you have people that are always, oh, woe is me. You know, life sucks. Nothing ever works out. And they do indeed live a life where everything sucks and things just don't work out for them because they are biasing probability to give them that kind of, of life. Uh, what you fear tends to, your, your fear if you're a fearful, you know, fearful person, the things that you fear, you tend to raise the probability of those things happening because of your fear. Because that's energy being put into that, to that outcome, is the outcome you fear. So anyway, that, that answers then a whole lot of, lot of questions of how people can you know, use their intent to, to uh, modify the nature of things. Like that, that will explain uh, the uh, placebo effect. How is it that uh, what you tell a person about the medicine they're taking and about their illness can actually affect 
the state of that illness. So you give a person a, a pill, you know, with uh, sawdust in it, and you tell them it's a wonderful new medicine and it's going to make their kidney problem go away. It's made everybody else's kidney problem go away, and it's really going to be great. And you'll find out that even though they've had no medicine whatsoever, about 35% of them, their kidney problem, you know, goes away. It helps um, uh, compared to a control group that aren't told anything. They're just given the sawdust and said, here, eat this. You see, so the, the control group should have as many just random events coming and going as, as the other group, but we find a statistical significance that, that the, the placebo effect is a real effect. Indeed, placebo effect is law. You can't sell a drug unless you can, you can uh, beat the placebo effect. So there's a paranormal phenomena that's a part of our legal system. So anyway, we go back to these other things. So you can get into these databases if you use your intent as a query and get information out of the, for about the probable future. Again, it's only probable. And you can get information out of the database that's historical, including all the things that could have happened but didn't, as well as the things that did happen. And all the information is there. And when I say all the information, I don't mean like information you're used to in a book. I mean, every uh, think of a character. Think of yourself and the history that's, that's being piled up there for your choices. It would be all of your feelings, all of your attitudes, all of your thoughts, all of your emotions. It's everything about you because all of this is part of the information system, you see. So it's a complete uh, description of the event, including a description of you and your moods and what your you know, being level is doing and what your intellectual level is doing and all of your intents and feelings and all the rest of it goes. So it's not just a record of what happened and when it happened. It's the full, it's the full record. So we can get around in those, those things. Um, now, uh, what about uh, people who have precognitive dreams? It's one of the things you mentioned. Well, that's just getting into that uh, database and seeing what is possible and what is probable. And if your intent is focused, you can do a, a you know you can go in there with precision and get information. If your intent's real foggy, you get you know real foggy results. It's like in Google, you know, <laughs> Google Google love, and you get millions of returns. You know, and a lot of it's garbage. Uh, same with a sloppy uh, intent uh, in the databases. So you need precision, and often you get something that's not quite what you wanted, but close. And then you have to you have to. Uh, modify your query to make it more specific. And so it's the same kind of uh, process that you, you need to go through. So uh, what about mental healing? Well, that's changing the probability of a person's illness. If you heal them with your mind, it's not, you know, none of these things are really particularly hard. Anybody can learn to do them with a little practice. Um, what are some of those other things you mentioned? Uh, oh, synchronicity. We have synchronicity because as you said, our success is a system success. So if you are a person who is aware, then the system can feed you nudges, can give you information, can kind of help things happen to give you the challenge or the information that you just happen to need. So if you're such a person and you walk into a bookstore, suddenly your attention is just riveted on a particular book. And, or it's, it's just like the book jumped out of the shelf into your hand sort of thing. You know, you just walked over and grabbed that book for some reason. It was just one book among a whole lot. And you don't know what that reason is, but you just did it. And it turns out it's something that's really important. It's an information you really needed to have. Those kinds of events are called, uh, you know, synchronicity when they happen. They're synchronous events that things that just happen that, that if enough of them happen to you, you realize they're not random because they have, um, specific significant meaning to you it's not just a random event that well yeah you know i walk over and grab books out of libraries and you know half the time they're useless and the other half the time you know they're okay but you know that would just be randomness but when you live in a world where there's synchronicity it happens to you daily and all the time and you realize that it can't be random because it's too one-sided to be random so that's where synchronicity comes from the system wants you to wants you to succeed and can nudge you to uh, go on a particular path that would be good and challenging you to grow in ways that you need to grow. So we have that. But now it's not going to force anything because there's free will and it cannot interfere with your free will. So a nudge is all you're going to get. And if you won't 
if you won't accept that data, if you can't use it and can't process it, then you won't get it. So there are some people that just uh, can't be nudged because they just blow it off. Oh, I have to go over and grab that book. Well, that's stupid. Why would I want to grab that book? And they turn around and go the other way, right? Because they just can't process that data. And those are the people that have never had a synchronous event. They've never had a precognitive dream. They've never uh, heard someone else talk in their mind, you know, telepathically. And they don't have these kinds of experiences because they can't use them. They can't process them. So, wow. Wow. So how would we use information that perhaps causes us problems for our benefit? Um, <laughs> I'm really just I'm absorbing everything that you've been saying and it's it really is a lot of information huh yeah we have just barely scratched the surface <laughs> how can we learn from the things that present us problems i mean if if the system really does want me to succeed wouldn't it be feeding me these sort of success stories you know on a consistent basis or is there also a learning mechanism yeah. and evolution mechanism involved well, yes, you have, to, you have to learn. The system is not trying to lead the witness. You know, when it does the synchronicity, it's not trying to lead you into making choices that you otherwise wouldn't have made. Now it's interfering with your free will. You can't grow up if it's not really your choice. You see, you have to make it. It has to be your own choice made out of your own being level, out of the, out of the core of you. This is what you're like. This is the choice you make. And then you get consequences. Now, it can, it can kind of give you some information, it can kind of point you in a direction, but you have to actually use the information and go in the direction. You, know, you have to be able to process the data and use it. So if there's, something, uh, you know, if there's something going on in your life that is causing pain and uh, dysfunction, then that is a good sign that what you're doing and the choices you're making are suboptimal, that they're probably fear-based. And this pain is a challenge for you to, uh, to be different, not just to act different, but to be different. So the, the pain that we get in our life and the circumstances that we see as maybe not being good for us all offer us opportunity to make better choices. You see, first we have to take responsibility for all the choices we make. And most of us don't take responsibility for our choices. For instance, uh, somebody says something and it makes you angry. Somebody slighted you or said something uh, you know, real negative about you and, and it makes you angry. So you say, that person made me angry. It's not true. You chose to be angry. <laughs> that person created a situation where you had choices and you chose to be angry. So you have to take responsibility for who you are and what you are and not blame it on other people or situations or I was born poor, or I was born blind or, you know, whatever it might be, you have, you have certain choices and a decision space is basically all those choices you have. And somebody might say, well, I don't have the choice to be nice because that's just not the way I am. Somebody says something nasty to me, I get angry. Well, you do have the choices. You just aren't choosing those choices. You see, you're not you may not even be aware of those choices sometimes. You're just reacting out of your fear. Well, you, if you find that fear and get rid of it, now you have more choices. You live in a larger reality. You have a bigger decision space, and you are evolving. So all of, those, all of our dysfunction tends to come back and bite us in terms of unpleasant situations that we're in. We create most of the pain in our lives ourselves because of our choices. And we are a product of those choices. So it's not only our choice just now in the moment, it's our history of choices, you see, it creates situations that, that we are in. So if, if I make a fear-based choice, is, is it accurate to say that that, it, that same information would kind of loop back so that I could learn it again, so that I could make the love-based choice? Well, it's like this. There's no free lunch. You only can grow up if you if you make the effort to do it. Um, if you make a bad choice, then you just haven't learned that lesson. There was an opportunity to make a better choice and you missed that opportunity. 
Well, what happens is you get to try again and try again and try again, <laughs> and you just get to keep trying again with different kinds of choices and different sorts of uh, scenarios and situations until you grow up. And if that takes, you know, a long, long time, then it's just going to be a slow process of growing up. So it's, it's not like, well, I've been, you know, I've been working on this particular lesson for a long time, you know, just graduate me to the next level. That doesn't happen. You have to, the only way you get to the next level is to grow up. Now, another point we, we could make here is that I said that there was a free will awareness unit that was uh, immersed in this virtual reality and a kind of a larger part of that, and that's just a piece of a larger individuated unit of consciousness that's kind of the accumulator of all the experience. Because this learning is, is um, difficult, it takes a long time to change yourself at the being level and grow up, you have to, you have to accumulate that over a lot of different experience packets. Because what happens is that we get, uh, we, we ended up painting ourselves into a corner. By the time we're, we're old, we have come to believe that we know almost everything. We've been there and done that. And we have beliefs, we have fears, and we're not giving them up. You know, they're ours and that's just the way we are. Well, we kind of get stuck then. We're painting ourselves in a corner where we're no longer growing, being, becoming, uh, you know, uh, growing up. We're stopped. So the thing to do then is you have to let that go and have another experience packet. And some people then would call that reincarnation. So you have all these various experience packets, and it's a cumulative process to grow up. It's just not reasonable that you're going to grow up from where we start to a being of love in one experience packet. It won't happen. It's not, uh, not going to happen. So there are multiple um, then it works the same way in World of Warcraft. You know, that, that elf of yours probably gets killed three or four times every night that you play the game <laughs> because it's just the way the, it's just the way the game is, right? And, uh, it, you, what do you do? You go to the graveyard and, and, you know, have so to then start how do over. We, how do we win the game? Is that, I mean, is that the goal of winning the, the game? We, we, no, we don't win the game. It's the process that's important, not the, not the end goal. It's the growing up. That's the important. You don't win the game. You just get better and better at playing the game to where you don't need pain to hit you between the eyes with the two before to get your attention to grow up. Your life becomes full of joy and satisfaction because now you can grow up without the pain. You know, you are kind of past that, that part. So it's just getting, um, you know, we just keep growing up. The things about you know, entropy is much like infinity in that sense, is that you don't get to zero entropy. You can only get asymptotic toward it. In other words, you can only approach it, but you never get there. You can never actually get to infinity. Infinity is just an abstract concept. It's not something that is real or can exist as real. You can just approach it. You can get bigger and bigger, but you can never actually get to infinity. It's an impossible thing. So the end is not fixed. It's not like you get to a certain point and bingo, you win and you're done and uh, you've won the game. <laughs> it's a, it's a, uh, a process that goes on because this is an ev it's evolution. Remember, the larger consciousness system is not a fixed thing. It's evolving. It's changing. It's becoming. It's different to, you know, today than it was yesterday. And we are evolving and changing. This whole thing is a dynamic process. Evolution doesn't quit. Evolution will, as long as there are choices to be made, then evolution will keep on turning. It'll keep trying things, and the things that work will, will you know, go on, and the things that don't work will die out. And that's what it does. And in this virtual reality, there's tons of, of uh, choices and ways to go and unexplored paths and ways of being and relating that uh, we haven't explored yet. So evolution uh, is open-ended, and so is our existence. But the good news is it's not always tough and it's not always full of pain and it's not always stressful. It gets to be a lot of fun and, uh, and kind of a joyous trip. Once you get to a certain level of evolution, you know, the game's not just about you, it's about everybody. Then you become helpful and cooperative and help other people learn and grow and give them encouragement and a good example. So there's always something to do, some way to be useful and, and productive in this system. It's not like we're all cooperating to build a house, and when the house is done, it's done, and then we're out of work. 
this house will never get done because it's about us growing up. Growing up's a, a slow process. And I should say the system is not infinite and it's not perfect. It's a real system, which means it can't be infinite because infinite systems can't be real. And it's not a perfect system. It's just a system that's evolving and it has rules and structure. And sometimes these rules get violated. And sometimes violations get dealt with and sometimes they get away with it. It's just, a, you know, it's a, it's a real system. It's a good system, and it works well. It's very efficient, but uh, it's so not. So, you're you are perfect. an experimenter. I'm sorry to interrupt, but you, mm-hmm. you, I mean, you experiment. So, have you ever been able to recreate a situation where there is a type of glitch, or that you can cause something to be affected with, say, your mind, or maybe further than that? Yeah, you can. You can. Uh, you can cause things to happen with your mind because you can modify the future probability. So mind can affect what happens. That's, we, we all do that in some ways. That's why the reality that we're in, it's reality that we see. You know, just look at, you know, look at the news, watch the TV, uh, go out and walk around. And, and if you, you know, what you see is the way it is because of the way we are. It's a very accurate representation of the quality of humanity. Our average quality is, is basically represents the, the average stuff going on out there. So if you look at, uh, you know, that, that uh, terrible government, uh, that bad dictator, that, uh, you know, terrible money system and all the things that people, you know, complain most about, that that's the problem. Well, the reason that's that way is because we are the way we are, you see, we create this reality. It's our feedback. It's our intents. It's the way we interact with each other. So what you see is who we are. And the best way to fix it is to grow up individually because then that helps, uh, you know, the, you grow up and you become, a, you become a light to others and help others grow up. And that's how you fix it. If you decide, well, I can fix this system. I'll get rid of that nasty dictator and put in somebody better. That may be civilizing, and it may make things better for a while, but what you're doing is treating symptoms, not fixing the problem. And just like our, our medicine today is mostly symptomatic medicine. We don't, you know, our, our doctors often aren't treating core problems. They're not treating causes. They're awfully, often treating symptoms. You see, they just give us something to make us feel better, make the symptoms go away, while the body actually does its own healing. That's our typical medicine. So we fix that money system, we fix that dictator, and we've done a symptomatic relief, which might make everybody breathe easier and give us more time to cogitate and, and, and uh, meditate. But basically, we've just changed a symptom. We've we fixed a symptom, and that symptom will reassert itself. It won't stay fixed unless we change because it, that symptom's there because it reflects us. There was, there was a... There was a scene in The Matrix where I guess it was uh, Mr. Smith and he was it was when uh, Morpheus was was kind of captured uh, by the agents of The Matrix. And Mr. Smith is, is talking to Morpheus and he says that The Matrix was the way it was because because humans needed the 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 suffering aspect of it to learn that. The, the Matrix had once been a sort of utopia, but mm. humans had rejected it because it didn't work for their learning. Right. Well, it wasn't so much their learning. It, it, they, they weren't good batteries. Remember, they were using the humans as batteries to power their system. Right. And that's what the humans were. They were actually all of them little <laughs> voltaic cells uh, uh, providing power, and the humans didn't do well if they didn't have the... If they didn't have the struggle, they, they weren't good batteries then because they all just kind of, you know, um, they, they weren't challenged. Didn't Mr. Monroe fi- find out that we, it, this was a sort of battery type system? I, I think it was in uh, Ultimate Journey where he, I think in his journal, it said that he was pretty depressed after he found out and he stopped projecting for a while. Uh, that was the thing about Lush that you're talking about? Yes, yes. Yeah, 
Um, yeah, I remember when Bob wrote that because he was discussing it with uh, us. He was discussing <laughs> with me when he wrote that. He said, you know, I've been out and here's, here's the stuff I found. He was, he was telling us about it and I didn't have any sense that he was really uh, depressed after. He seemed to, he seemed to be just, just fine, but uh, it, was a, it was a big thing for him. And you have, to, you have to realize that what you get, you get in a data stream when you're in an out-of-body state it's just like being here. You're in a different virtual reality. Okay? It's not the same physical universe virtual reality, but a different virtual reality. You're still getting a data stream, and you still have to interpret that data stream based on your own history, based on your own uh, experience, you know, your, your, own data, your own data set, your own experience data, I guess would be a good thing to say. So that was Bob's interpretation of what was going on. And if you just take it literally... It's, uh, it says something that, that sounds a little, uh, you know, sci-fi-ish and, uh, yes, the, you know, we're the, we're the providers of, of lush for some other things to, to eat, but that's just a metaphor. Bob got, you know, we get metaphors when we're out there, we get, we get information and then we have to interpret them. That was Bob's interpretation. And you can, you can read that metaphor a little differently in that, uh, what we need to do and what people are supposed to be doing is becoming love, making these choices, uh, meeting the challenges. And that is what energizes the whole system. That's what makes the system work. That's the, uh, you know, that's the fuel that keeps the information system alive, if you will, is the fact that we are lowering entropy. So the fuel is us lowering entropy. And if you make that the loose, you can kind of see where the where the uh, metaphor is going. It, it's not quite the, uh, the same as, as if you take it literally. So that's really what was, what was happening there. Uh, one other question you said, well, what about spirits and gods and, and that kind of thing? And, and uh, so I would say that the larger consciousness system then becomes what theologians talk about, right? Theo is, is about God, right? And the larger consciousness system is our source. It's our creator. We are subsets of it, so you might say we're made in its image. Um, it uh, has all the data, so you might say it's omniscient, although that's not really true. There's things going on that it really doesn't know about because it only knows like we do with intent. And if its intent isn't there, then it's not paying attention. Um, it, um, it is... It, it is uh, trying to help us succeed because our success is its success. So we get synchronicity and other such things. So there's a lot of characteristics there that sound pretty similar to what various, you know, religions might say about, about God. In fact, I was, I was in a, um, a talk and at the end, uh, two theologians came up. I was doing this at the Atlanta uh, church in, in uh, Atlanta and two theologians came up and I asked them, I said, well, tell me uh, the attributes of God as you understand that concept. Just what are the attributes? And they thought about that for a while. And between the two of them, they listed uh, kind of a, a bunch of things. And all of the things they listed uh, were, were not things that had to do with uh, creed and dogma and, and ritual and that kind of stuff. It was all, they were, this was a unity church, so they were a little more... Uh, um, or I should say a little less dogmatic than many other religions might have been. But uh, when they were done with their list, all of the things they said were attributes of the larger consciousness system, you see? So that then becomes, becomes the, uh, you know, that is our, our creator. That's where we come from. That's us. We are consciousness, just like it is consciousness. We're subsets of it. So um, it's not perfect. It's not infinite. And that makes it a little different than most people's ideas of, of God. There is no ending. It's still evolving. It's in the state of becoming. But that's another thing. When it's a big, when it's a really a big toe, then it has to answer questions in theology as well as physics. <laughs> so that, that answers, you know, questions of theology. And if you look at that, it makes it easy to see what's the, what's the dogma, what's the nonsense, you know, what's the... Uh, the uh, stuff that's 
that's been added by the people over the years, and what's the real core concepts? You see, and then you can kind of look at the at the theology we have now, and it separates out very nicely as to what's significant and what isn't. So that's another aspect of it. Mr. Campbell, you are one of the smartest people I've talked to in my life, hands down. This is incredible information, man. I, I really, really, it has kind of connected a lot of dots for me that in my own thinking that I kind of had in my mind anyway, and it completes a sort of puzzle. It's eloquent. Yeah, I've, I've, of course, I've heard that a lot. But one of the things that, that's interesting is I've gone a lot of places and given talks, and, and most of the time I'll have somebody come up to me and they'll say, you know, are you a, are you a Tibetan Buddhist? Because I've studied Tibetan Buddhism for the last 15 years, and what you're talking about is right on. You know, that's Tibetan Buddhism. And somebody else will come up and say, I've been studying the, uh, um, oh, what is it, um, there's, a, there's some Christian Gnostics, uh, they tell me the same thing, and then there's the other, other isms and things, you know, and I've probably had dozens of these things that I'm just like, a, you know, and it's, it's, it's a whole lot like this and that, and that's the way it is. It, it, when you basically have a bigger picture, you find there's lots and lots of people who have had pieces of that bigger picture, and they all just kind of dovetail very nicely uh, together, and suddenly you can see the connections between them all and see how it all fits into one, you know, to one bigger picture. You see, that's, that's kind of, that's very neat. And what's doubly neat about it is that that same bigger picture that solves all this theology and metaphysics and paranormal and all that also does better physics. It also is, is kind of the future in physics. So it explains things that physics can't explain now. That's, that's the neat thing. If it were just metaphysics, then we have this tendency to say, well, we got science on one hand and we got this other touchy-feely stuff on the other hand, but the two really aren't connected. Actually, they're antagonistic with each other, but that's not the case. In the bigger picture, you derive all of it. It turns out that hard science, physics, chemistry, that's just a subset of, of, the, uh, of this, this reality, this uh, larger physical, well, what do we call it, the, the larger reality system that's our physical universe. It's just that science is, deals with those things in this universe that have low uncertainty. So where, there, where there's interactions in this rule set that are of very low uncertainty, that's hard science. Where you have more uncertainty, that's soft science, like uh, medicine and psychology and economics and sociology. Those are all soft sciences, and they don't deal in objective facts. They deal in statistics because they have variables that can't be isolated. You see, you deal with people, you deal with a lot of uncertainty. And uh, they are the soft sciences because they have more uncertainty. And then you get into things like metaphysics, and that seems to have even more uncertainty. So these are just various parts of this system that you can, that you can uh, look at, and, and uh, we kind of divide them up by how much uncertainty comes with them, because the ones that have very little uncertainty, they're easier to deal with, so we do those first. That's science kind of started uh, out dealing just with those things, and scientists, the hard scientists, um, even have a hard time calling things like economics and you know, sociology science, but they are. They're just a science that works with the subjective as well as the objective, and you work with subjective science with statistics. And metaphysics isn't any different. So when I'm doing research in the larger conscious system, from then it, the, the idea was like from an out-of-body state, well, it's the same thing. This is subjective science, and the way you do real science with that is, is with statistics. You have to do things over and over again and see what, you, what changes when you change you know, the variables you can control. Do you, think, do you think that's why Mr. Monroe is so good at kind of chronicling objectively his experiences? It, he was just, he was a very good navigator, I would say. He was, and, and he was, he did a, you know, he, he was more of an engineer by personality. Now, he, I don't think he really was an engineer, 
he was uh, he was a businessman. This is his forte. He was in radio before he was in cable business. Uh, he was a pilot, small plane. So he thought, though, he had the personality of an engineer. In other words, things had to make sense to him. He had to be logical. He needed to see the causal chain or he wasn't going to accept it. That was just his personality. So when he wrote his books, he had the, you know, instead of trying to interpret it all for his audience, what he thought it all meant, he most of the time just wrote down exactly what it was he experienced. It was like a diary. You know, here's what I experienced. I experienced these things. I did this and then this happened and that happened. And, you know, the next day I did something else. So he doesn't try to tell us how to think about it and what to make of it. He just tells us what happened. Of course, what he tells us happened is his own interpretation of the, of the metaphors that he gets in the data stream from that virtual reality. But still, it's, it's honest. It's a very straightforward. And that's something we hadn't had before. Before, when you read books about uh, astral projection and that sort of thing, there was so much, um, oh, you know, disjointed theory in it that really didn't make sense. So they were trying to make their best guess of, of, you know, what it was and what it all meant, but they were, it was mostly coming out of their own beliefs and their own limitations. So it, it, it made it a lot harder to, to read and to get something out of, whereas Bob's, it's just straightforward. And he was a good reporter in that he didn't, he didn't color it, he just stated it. And that's why, it, that's why it's endured. So just just close cl- to close out. We're running out of time here, but um, what? So then, what is your interpretation of of what he was experiencing? And and spoiler spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't read the books, the, uh, there was he was collecting himself. It seemed to exit the Earth life system. I mean, is that is that analysis correct? Yes, you might say that that is the way it was going on. That was his interpretation. Uh, it really shouldn't be taken literally. It wasn't, it wasn't a literal thing. Um, the information that he was getting is that he, he was an individuated unit of consciousness that had the uh, kind of the collection or the, you know, learning has to be cumulative. He was the accumulator and he was accumulating his own experiences. So it's like he was the free will awareness unit that's a subset of this individuated unit of consciousness that's the c- accumulator of all the experience packets you might have a, a free will uh, awareness unit might be you know let's say that's that's you and your your um, individuated unit of consciousness some people will call that oversoul uh, higher self or something like that it may have another incarnation going on at the same time it's not necessarily just one at a time although that's typical it may have several. So it's accumulating all this information and he is feeding it. So he was accumulating himself, if you will. And that was to grow up, to become love, to uh, evolve in the positive direction. So if you look at it like that, that's kind of the, you know, that's, that's kind of the picture of what he was seeing. And he just uh, laid it out in more detail because of his own history and, and background. He didn't see kind of the, the larger picture of that, so he gave just what he saw, just how he interpreted it. So that's what, you, that's what you get there. So that's what we're doing. And this whole, you know, like, like Bob wasn't aware that what he saw was his interpretation. He just, what he saw was what he saw, and it was there. So in Bob Monroe's books, he talks about this park that he goes to, and he goes to his park to relax and kind of meditate and, and uh, think, and, and that's his park. You see, somebody else who had the same sort of data stream would say, oh, I go out in a rowboat in the middle of a lake, and I just sit and drift. And somebody else would say, oh, I stand on a butte uh, in uh, Nevada and just look you know, out at this vast, you know, so it's individualized. You're- yes, and somebody else goes out into the woods and, and hikes. And so Bob Monroe had a park because that's, that is what gave, that's what meant to him of this serene place where he could kind of go and just, and just be. It was a nice, protected, pleasant place to be. So 
it was a park because that's Bob's interpretation of that data stream. Everybody has to interpret the data they get based on their own uh, experience base. And that's true of us as free will awareness units. Here we are, consciousness, we're playing an avatar, we're getting a data stream. We have to interpret that data stream in terms of our experience base. So two people get the same data stream, they interpret it differently. Now, if they come from the same culture, they probably interpret it similarly. They come from vastly different cultures, they may interpret it completely differently. You see, so it's, it has to do with, with who we are, you know, for the culture we're in, Bob was a straightforward reporter and most of us kind of understand what he was saying. It's a mistake to take it too literally. You kind of have to read between the lines, not just, not just the lines. It's like that in, a, in an out-of-body situation. It's a data stream. It's another virtual reality. It's not reality. When you die here, when the body dies here, just like when your elf dies, you know, here, with your elf, you run to the graveyard and then you have to go back and collect all your stuff. But uh, when you die here, you end up in another virtual reality. It's not the graveyard, but it's another virtual reality where you um, begin to plan, if you will, and process to another experience packet because that's what you do. You go from experience packet to experience packet trying to evolve the quality of your consciousness so the system can, can evolve with you. Wow. Uh, Mr. Campbell, thank you so much for this conversation. I've learned more in the last couple hours than I have in, in a while. So oh. thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Is there, is there a site where people can find your work? Yes. And I would, you know, I have a website, but that website's a little broken right now. I'm in the process of, of doing better, but there's still a lot of information there. Um, you can find, uh, all of my talks, my interviews, you will be able to find this very interview, uh, on my uh, YouTube, uh, everything I do, uh, one of the requirements is that it be put out for free. And they're all on YouTube. They're all for free. My books are for free on Google Books, uh, although it is an older first printing version. And I'm up to like printing number five now. So it's, it's a little outdated in the details, but it's mostly, it's mostly the same. So you, it's still a good one to, uh, to read. But go to YouTube. I've got like 200 and 15, 220 videos there. Um, I caution people to take it a small bite at a time. Some of those videos are uh, like Calgary. It's a real good summary. It was a Calgary workshop is what it's called. It's about three years old now. But I did a real good over the, you know, over the top kind of flyby of all the concepts and what they meant and so on. And it's, you know, Friday I gave about two and a half hour uh, overview and then Saturday we talked all day about the theory which means like six or seven hours and then Sunday we do uh, exercises in uh, experiencing the larger reality so I teach people how to uh, you know about remote viewing and out of body and how to heal with your mind and then we do some exercises in healing and remote viewing and so on so that's if you take that all together you're like 14 you know 15 16 hours out of that that uh, Calgary workshop. And of course, that's intimidating to people. A 15 hour video, you know, no way. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, take it in like, you know, 20 minute chunks. That's the good thing about YouTube. You can always come back <laughs> and pick up where you left off. Yeah. And Very then you true. can get through. And some of them are short. Some of my things are as short as five minutes. So it's, it's just lots of stuff out there. Love it. Love it, man. Well, you guys heard it here. This is the human experience. Thank you so much for listening, guys. This was such a fun episode. Uh, we will tech check you guys next week. Thank you.